Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this Autism Training and Technical Assistance Project webinar, monthly webinar. Uh, my name is Kirsten Bayer with the Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support at Illinois State University, and I will be the moderator for today's webinar along with my colleagues, Carissa Melody and Brittany Boston. Um, today's topic is Mental Health Awareness Month Self-Care, presented by Dr. Teresa Reagan, and we will be hearing from her shortly. But before we do, just a couple of housekeeping things. As a reminder, all participants on this webinar are in listen-only mode, and you cannot unmute yourselves. If you have questions as the webinar proceeds, please post those in the Q&A or the chat box, and we will address them at the end of the webinar. It is important to remember that that text box where you can ask questions or comments or concerns it might be labeled something differently on your um, desktop that you're joining us from today. If you're joining us from an iPad or a phone or a computer, it could be labeled the chat box or the Q&A box or the text box. And so just keep that in mind, but those are all synonymous and you can converse with us through that. Um, and then a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and the presentation recording and materials today will be available on the autism training website within 48 hours of today's session and we will put that website in the chat momentarily and then in an effort to be as accessible as possible this webinar will be offering closed captioning and at the end of today's webinar each attendee will receive a follow-up email tomorrow which will include a survey asking about today's webinar. We would appreciate any feedback you are willing to give us and suggestions to help improve upcoming webinars. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to my colleague, Carissa Melody, who will introduce our speaker for today. Carissa? Good morning, I'm Carissa Melody, um, and welcome to our webinar on uh, self-care for Mental Health Awareness Month. I'm here with my good friend, Teresa Reagan. Um, I'll introduce her in just a minute. For now, I just wanna talk about our project. So the Autism and Training Technical Assistance Project, ADA, develops and presents resources that assist individuals with autism in their transition from secondary education to post-secondary education or employment. ADA provides training and support to important stakeholders as they work to provide equitable experience for individuals on the spectrum. The Illinois Center for Specialized Professional Support, ICSPS, creates, supports, and delivers professional development for education educators across Central Illinois. ICSPS provides technical assistance, develops publications, and facilitates program improvement strategies for our partners as they relate to college transition, recruitment, retention, and completion, encouraging achievement of special population learners. ICSPS was founded in 1977 at Illinois State University and is housed in the Educational Administration and Foundations Department in the College of Education. So ICSPS and the Illinois State Board of Education bring to you the Autism and Training Technical Assistance Project by a grant provided through the Illinois State Board of Education. And here's our website, autismcollegeandcareer.com. So right now we just wanna launch a couple quick polls just to see who our audience is, where you're located. Um, so ISBE has divided us up, the state of Illinois, into six different regions. But for our webinar purposes, we have combined the top two, Chicago and the Northeast. So just click on the region that um, you're coming to us from. Sorry, I need to stop screen sharing, Kirsten. No, you don't. The poll is up. Oh. I think you just can't see it because you're oh, sharing. I just can't see it. Okay, so, yeah, sounds good. We Got have it. about 74% voted, so we'll go ahead and close the poll and share the Great. results. Thank you so much. 
we have about 36% from the Northeast and Northwest, and then 50% from Central Illinois, and a couple of us joining from the Southern part of the state. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you for the Southern part of your state for reaching out to your friends, because I know last, last month I said, please keep sharing and reaching mm -hmm. out to your friends, because we're trying to really reach that Southern part. So one more poll. The next poll is which ADA stakeholder do you represent? So we um, like to provide resources and do webinars for all of you, for all of our educators, the student or young adult on the autism spectrum, communities, families, employers. Some of you might be teachers and have a child on the autism spectrum. So go ahead and click all that apply. Okay, so that poll is up and we have people voting. We'll give them a couple more seconds. Great. <clears throat> okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the poll and share the results. We have about 59% from the secondary and post-secondary system. 71% are students or young adults. 29% are families um, of autism and 12% are communities and 6% are joining us from an employer stakeholder. So I'm gonna hide those results now. Wonderful, thank you so much. Again, my name is Carissa Melody. I'm the Access and Transition Coordinator here at ICSPS. I have been with ICSPS since October of 2020. Our presenter today is Teresa Reagan. Um, she is actually the lead neuropsychologist at OSF here in Peoria, and she's been a neuropsychologist for over 25 years. She is the founder of the Adult Autism Diagnostic Clinic at OSF. Um, she's also the mother of the son on the autism spectrum, and she's certified um, She's a certified autism clinician. She's authored several books and podcasts. Um, we're gonna go ahead and put her website in the handouts or the chat, I'm not sure which one, but it's the adult and geriatric autism.com. And there you're gonna find courses for professionals, resources for individuals and families. Um, she's was my neighbor for several, several years. Our boys were best friends growing up littles you know all the way through second grade when we moved away um so anyway i'm just so happy that she was able to do this with us so here is Teresa reagan speaking on um self-care for mental health awareness month all right um as carissa said i have experience with the spectrum at a lot of different intersecting levels. So some of what I'll share today is based on my professional experience. Some is based on my personal experience in my day-to-day -day life uh, with my son who was diagnosed when he was five, and now he's a teen. So I have included various things about self-care that I think are pertinent to the spectrum and some recommendations that I think really help get the best outcome and the best uh, centering and regulation for people on the spectrum. So just to review some of the outline for today, first we're gonna talk about why self-care, that attention to self-care, this intentional thought about how am I doing and what do I need, why that's important particularly for individuals on the spectrum. We're going to talk about how uh, supports and intervention for self-care are often delivered. So the most common mental health strategies and, and treatment programs and supports. And then we're gonna talk about why those um, are likely not enough and not targeted specifically enough to the individual on the spectrum. And we're gonna talk then about alternate strategies to add as layers, not to replace uh, traditional mental health strategies necessarily, but to add as additional layers to get um, the best outcome for individuals on the spectrum. Uh, we're gonna talk about individuals, and we're also gonna talk about strategies for care of the group. So um, this could be a school environment, a 
group of students, it could be a family group, because as we all know, attention to how the group is doing is very important. And uh, so we're gonna talk about strategies to use when an individual in the group or more than one is on the spectrum. Uh, so that'll be our focus and our order for the day. So Carissa, if you wanna move that forward to the next slide. All right, so when I talk about self-care uh, and why it's important on the spectrum, we're gonna talk about regulation. And some of you may be um, familiar with that term uh, as used with the spectrum. So regulation is that the brain is supposed to help us regulate, become centered with our emotions and behavior and with our physical state. So if you think of a thermostat as a kind of regulator that you can turn the temperature up or down depending on where you need for your comfort level. So in emotional regulation, our brain should help us calm, it should help us think clearly, um, behavioral regulation, it should help us uh, interact with other people without um, you know, having an outburst toward them. And physically, our brain is also supposed to help us regulate as well. I need to get up in the morning and get going. I need to calm down for sleep at night. I need to stay uh, alert during the day and attentive and focused. So the center and the front part of the brain, the subcortical frontal systems of the brain, uh, really contribute to our ability to regulate. And all humans have you know, some ups and downs and some challenges with how we do on any particular day, staying centered and even. But uh, more so for individuals on the spectrum where that subcortical frontal pathway is problematic in different ways. And the emotional and behavioral regulation uh, can either look really loud and external if they're dysregulated, so that would be any externalizing reaction, or, and too often this is missed, it can be a quiet dysregulation, which is just as important to take care of and recognize. So the externalized reactions, I'm just gonna call fight reactions, but I also include crying spells in here. So meltdowns, crying spells, outbursts, aggression, arguments, anything that's kind of uh, whooshing forward and um, into the environment externally. Now the internalized reactions, when someone's dysregulated and they're having a quiet reaction, that could be flight. So that would be escape, withdrawal, quitting, leaving. So that could be, I'm quitting this conversation. I'm quitting this class. I'm going uh, home because I'm overwhelmed at school. I'm going to my room rather than talking to my parents, et cetera. So that it's that withdrawal, that's the flight. And that's also a sign of dysregulation that this person is not centered in their emotions and their attention. There can also be freeze reaction. So that would be a shutting down. So a lot of times people can say, I can tell it's almost like this curtain falls down, you know, and I just know that she's not there anymore. She's not, she's physically sitting there, but not processing what's happening. This could be when someone puts their head on the table. Um, it can look like steering spells. So people can wonder if there's some seizure activity there, um, but it may just be this clue that the person's dysregulated. They're not calm and centered and attentive at the same time. Another reaction I'm going to include under internalizing um, is a dissociation and somatization reaction. So dissociation is where the person kind of um, separates their mind from their body. And so sometimes you can talk about this in related to trauma reactions where you kind of feel outside of yourself. And this, the characteristics of that would be if somebody says, um, I don't remember yesterday or I don't remember school. So you're, you're losing memory and processing for large chunks of time or days, that would be um, 
suggestive of a dissociative reaction. And somatization is uh, similar, but it's that the dysregulation is processed through the physical system. So that could be headaches, it could be stomach aches, um, and it can be these non-epileptic seizures that can look like an actual seizure. And we don't know until they're hooked up to the EEG that while they're having the spell, it's not actually electrical. Um, so it's really amazing what the brain will do to try to protect us from these overwhelming sensations. So it can end in this, um, what looks like an overt seizure, memory lapses, dizziness, headache, numbness, difficulty breathing. And the important thing to know about somatization is that those symptoms are real. They're not feigned, they're not um, imagined. Uh, the only difference between those and symptoms um, in another category would be that these aren't generated by illness or injury. They're generated because of the person's really falling apart and dysregulated. So very important to know, but we want to treat them in a way that will re relieve that suffering um, and medical treatments when that's present isn't going to relieve that. So other self-care strategies will be important. And also physical regulation. So a lot of times people on the spectrum have difficulty with how their engine is running. So if you've ever heard that term, I really like the metaphor. How is your engine running today? Um, so physically, are you low, sluggish, tired, can't get up, can't change from a sleeping to an alert state? Are you running too high where you're hyperactive and restless and pacing and your mind is going a mile a minute? Um, so a lot of times people on the spectrum struggle with that. Like I'm tired during the day, I can't get up so I don't go to school, I can't go to bed at night so I fall asleep at one in the morning. So that kind of thing also happens on the spectrum, not uncommonly. Also just um, attending to things that do help us regulate, like have I eaten enough nutrition? Am I hydrated? So awareness of how the physical state is doing and how to support um, its best function. All right, next slide. Another thing on the spectrum that puts people at risk for issues with self-care is this executive function difficulty. And, you know, that's the same pathway in the brain, the subcortical frontal pathway that's in charge of executive function. And we're not gonna go through all the aspects of what executive function includes, but we're going to look at four examples that might impact successful self-care. So one is that ability to monitor what's internal. So we could call that metal, uh, metacognition. How am I doing? Why am I? Why am I feeling this state? Why is this triggered in me? What do I need? So it's this internal analysis. So we're using metacognitive skills when we say, well, this is what I'm thinking, this is what I'm feeling, and this is what I need. But the person on the spectrum is likely to have difficulty with that. And there'll be individual differences. So one person might have a relatively good metacognitive ability on the spectrum, and another person really struggle with that. Prioritization. So this is often very difficult on the spectrum because the individual gets this signal from the brain that something is very important and meaningful and compelling. And another thing just isn't compelling. You know, it's it just does not feel important. Um, and I call that kind of a problem with hashtags. So um, for the person on the spectrum that feels like model trains are so compelling and absorbing and um, they just capture me and I can't move on, but uh, showering is not that compelling or attending class is not that, that compelling and meaningful. So the hashtag problem is kind of what does the brain hashtag as important or meaningful and what does it hashtag as ah? not so much compelling or important. Another, another has to do with sequencing and pacing. So a lot of times individuals on the spectrum 
tend to be all in or all out. Um, and their ability to say, you know, I'm in this for the long term, so I'm going to do one step at a time. I'm going to pace myself so that I can really um, do well across the long term. So someone might be all in with exercise and swim for two and a half hours a day and then injure themselves, and then they're all out. Then they do nothing, right? So what we'd like is this pacing and sequencing and little bits at a time on a consistent level. And the fourth is predicting likely outcomes. So um, individuals on the spectrum often have really nice intellectual skills and they can uh, tell you the facts of their situation. They can recite rules about what they should do or what's, what, what should be most important. But that's almost, um, you know, so intellectual, it doesn't play out. And to predict an outcome, you have to be able to think abstractly. And what I find on the spectrum is even when a person can recite all these facts, they often struggle with what's likely to happen if I do this. And so somebody might say, well, I really uh, liked teaching Sunday school, so I might like being an elementary school teacher. But someone on the spectrum might say, well, how would I know if I would like being a teacher because I've never done that? So the ability to imagine what might happen if. So to predict um, the impact of something. So for example, a high school student might say, I really want to go to the pep rally um, and go and then just collapse afterward. And it was way too much, even though the wanting was there, but her ability to predict, oh, that's probably gonna be hard for me. It's probably gonna take its toll. Uh, was difficult. All right, Carissa. So we're switching now to talk about if that's the case and self-care, it helps someone center and regulate and people on the spectrum have more difficulty with that than the neurotypical, uh, what is it that we do for them? Well, typically, our common mental health strategies might involve counseling, encouraging the person to self-advocate, uh, encouraging them to talk themselves out of it, and medication support. And I in no way feel that these aren't appropriate, but what I see happening is sometimes these are the only strategies that we have or that we use, and they're just not a good fit for every individual on the spectrum, and we'll talk about why. So counseling um, is often a good strategy, but if the counselor is not autism informed, uh, they may rely on strategies that aren't quite a good fit. So they may rely on this interpersonal social relationship because that's what counseling is. And they might say, what are you feeling right now? And what are you thinking? And how can I be supportive of you? So tell me what you need. Um, the person then has to communicate interpersonally face to face with this person they don't know about their internal process, which they may not really be aware of and what they need and do it in this very connected interpersonal way. Um, and then a lot of our therapies say, well, um, let's have you change your thought pattern or let's have you um, change your perception of this relationship. Um, let's consider other people's needs in your home, et cetera. And there's this educational component. So we hear the client's rendition, their narrative about what they're feeling and what's happening. And then we offer solutions to shift that through education. So they might say, well, uh, this is really important. Let me educate you why. And then we'll say, now go ahead and do that. Go ahead and change your behavioral pattern. And then come back and report to me that your pattern has changed. And I kind of think of the comparison of um, if we had a 
uh, student who was really struggling with color identification. And we said, you know what, let me educate you on why identifying colors is important in life. So let me talk to you about street signs and dressing in a certain pattern. And let me talk to you about being an electrician and there are certain colored wires and et cetera. And the person verbalizes agreement. Yes, I agree, that is important. So I'm gonna give you homework to do. These are worksheets and you should go home and practice so that you get better in this skill. And then they come back and, oh, Johnny's still not doing well with color identification. And the years go by and in junior high school, you know, you say to the parent at the teacher conference, you know, all the other kids have achieved this, but Johnny just isn't. He agrees that it's important and yet, you know, he's not moving forward with it. Well, if Johnny is colorblind, that strategy is not going to work. So we do have to see if educating someone and having them practice different strategies is something that neurologically fits with how they see the world, how they interact with the world, how they interpret the world. Um, and sometimes that's that traditional counseling pattern is going to work really well with an individual on the spectrum. And sometimes it's just not going to land anywhere. They can't perceive the world the same way. And so having a therapist that's informed about those individual differences can be helpful. We might encourage people to self-advocate, and that's wonderful. Um, it is important to know that self-advocacy requires certain neurologic abilities. And so one person on the spectrum may be really there, like they're ready to self-advocate. They can identify what their needs are. They can approach someone else, social approach, which is part of autism. They can verbally communicate in this interpersonal format what their needs are, and they can identify and carry out a plan. Um, but a lot of individuals on the spectrum, that is a whole part of their neurologic struggle in the first place. And so having kind of a partner in advocacy can be more successful, whether that's a parent or a teacher or a spouse, um, that there's someone that helps identify what are you struggling with and what's the gap there and let's figure out how to communicate that. Um, a lot of times we ask people to use their thinking skills to change their regulation. So we'll say, calm down. Um, you know, talk yourself through it. It's not the end of the world. And, you know, that, again, is fine as a strategy, but there's a lot of limitations, I think, on the spectrum where um, using intellect to regulate emotions and behavior, you know, those two brain systems aren't intimately connected. And so just because I can intellectually identify something I believe with, it doesn't mean that it can shift my regulatory pattern. Um, so a lot of times relying only on trying to talk themselves out of their dysregulation isn't very successful. And medication management, again, a very nice layer for many people on the spectrum. A lot of times when medication is used, there are four areas that it tries to help people with who are on the spectrum. And one is attention, one is anxiety and depression, another area is sleep, and another area is uh, aggression or outbursts. What the meta-analytic literature shows is that um, if a medication is about 80% successful for those who are neurotypical, it's probably about 40% successful for those on the spectrum. And really that's because it's not gonna change the neurologic connectivity. It's gonna offer some chemical support, which is nice. But for people who are going from doctor to doctor looking for that magic combination, that's gonna shift their dysregulation, they're probably going to be disappointed. But if they say, hey, this may be a nice layer to add in, along with other strategies, then they might have, you know, an outcome that feels successful to them. 
It's also true that there's a bit more of a side effect profile for some medications for those on the spectrum. So just having people watch for that, there can be a little bit more anxiety with stimulus medica or, um, stimulant medication, uh, sometimes some release of the motor stereotyped um, features or tics can be a little more common as well. All right, next slide. So I really wanna offer some alternate strategies um, that I have found to be, again, a nice added layer um, that may help with better outcomes of self-care, of regulating a little bit better. So one is trying to help the person with self-knowledge. And this is kind of like coming alongside of them and trying to help them feel, uh, figure out how they're wired um, and so usually we don't wanna tell people how they're feeling, right? Or we want to allow them space to feel it. But sometimes for the person on the spectrum, they might have a really good sense of valence, like I feel bad or I feel good, but they may lack a sense of what the specific thing is. What is that specific emotion and what triggered that? Like what's it connected to? Um, and so sometimes we might just say, when somebody is having a meltdown or an outburst, we could say, you're really angry right now. And just that calm voice so that they're starting to recognize what anger feels like. Or you could say, I'm wondering if you feel this, because that looks how I might look when I feel that. So some of it is helping them recognize what emotions feel like. Um, another thing is really focusing on strategy. So instead of focusing on the traditional counseling method of this is why um, your emotions are important, this is why coping is important, now go practice that, I find it much more effective to focus on strategy. So what strategy can we use to help your system feel more centered, to help you feel more calm? Because that's really important that you feel calm. So instead of being a police officer saying, calm down, like you need to stop what you're doing and correct it, and I'm gonna give you a consequence for it. What we're doing is shifting that and we're saying, hey, let's be a detective because your well-being is very important. And I can see that you're really feeling off. You're feeling, um, you know, very uncentered. So what strategy could we help you use so that your system feels better? Um, so for example, if my son would come home from school and he'd go straight to the couch and he'd put a blanket all the way over himself while he laid on the couch, um, well, that's a sign to me, that's a clue, that's revelation. So I'm not gonna say, hey, you didn't say hello to me, you dropped your book bag on the floor, get out here, um, have better behavior. No, I'm gonna say, oh, that's a clue, that's revelation. So that's that flight, I'm gonna go hide. So I know he's dysregulated, right? I don't know if he knows that or not. So what I would, do is come in and say, wow, I can see that you've had a tough day. I'm going to give you five or 10 minutes just to regroup. And then I'm going to come back and we can figure out what your system needs right now to feel better. So you want them to know that their well-being is important, that you come alongside them to think of how to do this. Um, so you might say, I'm wondering if your system would like this, or this sometimes helps you feel better. Would you like to try it? So for my son, we had a swing that was connected to his ceiling and it was that whole body swing. So I might say to him, hey, do you think your system would feel better if you laid in your swing for a little bit? And then we could try that. So it's this problem focused trial and error. And then he gets to say, oh, that did help. Or he, he knows it shifted him. Or he could say, no, I still feel this. Um, so what you're teaching them is to know when they're dysregulated. So me saying, I can tell you had a bad day. This is what that feels like. To give them space to regroup and also to say, 
hey, there are strategies where you can shift that. You can shift that. Let's figure out a strategy. And I'm going to come alongside you. So very strategy focused. And we can do the next slide. Another thing, thing I think um, is very underused is using sensory inputs to help the nervous system regulate better. We rely a lot on talking and on punishment or consequences. And I really think we should tone down the talking and correction and even processing. Some of that is just noise when someone's dysregulated. So focusing on how to give them some physical inputs to calm and center their nervous system and get better attention, I think has um, a lot better outcome. There are two uh, basic systems that often help people self-regulate, and then some uh, input from other systems can be good too. And the two uh, big ones would be proprioceptive input and vestibular input. Um, the other senses, you know, people can use a lavender scent to feel calmer. You know, they can touch something soft to feel calmer. But the proprioception is our awareness of where our body is in space. So if you close your eyes and you move your body around, you can still know where your arms and legs are. And that's because you have this proprioceptive sense. And when the body receives proprioceptive input, it receives it when it has pressure in the joints by pushing, pulling, hanging, and or pressure in the muscles, like with a bear hug, swaddling, a weighted blanket. And that proprioceptive input can help people adjust how their engine's running. So if they're running too slow and sluggish and I can't get up in the morning and I can't concentrate and I feel spacey, that proprioceptive input can help them move to the center and alert and pay better attention. And if they are running too high and they're hyperactive and restless and nervous and pacing and their mind won't shut off, it can help them move to the center as well. Vestibular input is a little bit more individually based. So some people are very motion insecure and motion sensitive, but some people are going to use motion input to help regulate as well. Now, vestibular does not mean just moving your arms and legs. Vestibular is when your body moves through space so that the fluid in your ear moves. And when that fluid moves, your brain receives vestibular input. So for example, when you're walking on a treadmill, uh, you're not receiving vestibular input. But when you're walking through the neighborhood, you are because you're moving through space. And that can be why some people don't like to work out on machines. They like to actually get vestibular input. I like to ride my bike, not do a stationary bike. So they're actually regulating with movement through space. Now you can tell that you know gentle vestibular input is what we do with babies when we just rock a little bit and that's calming. Or when a baby rides in a car and it falls asleep, that movement of the rhythm of the car is vestibular input in a very gentle and linear way. And there are all different levels of vestibular input that somebody might use. So the kid that races their skateboard down Killer Hill is really needing a lot of vestibular input and is seeking a lot of input. Uh, sometimes vestibular input can be alerting and awaking. Uh, help with alertness and awaking. So some people get ready for their day by going for a run in the morning, and then they're really on it for work, right? They like, oh, now I'm awake. Well, a lot of that can be that vestibular input. And they're also getting proprioceptive input through the joints when they're running. I uh, recently had a situation where I was at a public event and I was standing in line and the line was indoor. Uh, inside this hallway and the hallway kind of snaked around and it was really a narrow hallway so it kind of fit one person 
it was a little claustrophobic even for me and it was loud oh my gosh there were all these people in line and i thought i hope i can make it to the front of the line because this is kind of overwhelming to me and luckily i didn't have my son with me but other parents had ha huh, middle school kids or you know that that level of kid there so one boy behind me who was about that age his mom was talking to somebody there and he was supposed to stand politely right so he was there standing and all of a sudden he shook 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 his head back and forth vigorously and then he stopped and then he'd shake 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 his head and then he'd stop and his mom turned to him and said don't do that you know be calm be quiet be still and so he did, but I'm thinking, oh, he's using vestibular input to actually stay in line. Like he's trying to find some input that can help him tolerate this closed, crowded space. And so I would say, good job. Does that make you feel better? Your brain really likes that. Um, so you can kind of see that sensory input at work. And you can think of sensory strategies as a bottom up strategy where you're using the lower parts of the brain to support the center part and calm and regulate. Instead of using thoughts, which is the upper part of the brain, a top-down strategy, I'm gonna convince myself to calm down. And again, you can use both, but I always think that the addition of the sensory part is very important for self-care. Um, I also think of scheduled self-care and crisis self-care. So I would always have the person just have a routine. This is what my nervous system needs, and I don't wait until I feel like I need it. A lot of people on the spectrum, because they're not as in tune to subtle cues in their internal state, they will be so genuine in saying, I am doing great. I feel awesome. I'm invested in this project. I'm interested in it. I've met interesting people. And then all of a sudden, like they crash, they are not good, they can't get out of bed and they don't see the signs coming. So I, I just say, you know what, don't wait till you feel that you've crashed. Just know that your nervous system needs this schedule, this sensory input, this routine to feel as stable as possible over the long term. Um, and someone might learn well, what does my crash tend to look like? What works for me? And then when you do have a bad day, you can add self-care for that crisis. So maybe um, a student has to give a lecture or a presentation during class, and they know that's gonna be super difficult. So they add some proprioceptive input before the presentation, and they ask to take a calming break after the presentation. So that would be crisis self-care. All right, next slide. And I also like to talk about group and family care. So taking care of the group. Um, one of the things I really try to emphasize for people is that as you're coming alongside people who have, uh, whose nervous system needs a certain thing for self-care, you can start introducing that topic that everybody has different needs. You know, my nervous system works this way, but your nervous system really likes this instead. And it's this uh, teaching that there's individual differences and that that's okay. And what you end up trying to do is not make people change their nervous system to meet your needs, but you increase the awareness of the individual nervous system differences in what you each need and then you problem solve or you compromise so that you you each get what you need um, so for example a parent uh, that i worked with once had a couple kids and they were on the spectrum and she was as well and you know one of her daughters regulated with a lot of vestibular input and one of her favorite things was music and singing so she would be spinning and running and falling and singing. And the mom needed quiet noise reduction and, and a quiet visual environment. Visual clutter upset her, visual spinning upset her. And so I invited her to start talking with her daughters 
to instill this understanding that, hey, your nervous system works different. It's not that, you know, you're a bad person or I'm going to give you consequences for this, but I see what your body's trying to do. It's trying to feel better. My body really needs to feel better too. My system really needs quiet. How can we each get what we need? So maybe I'll go to my room for quiet time and we'll set the time timer so you know where I am. And where are you going to do your dancing? Um, and so that you're teaching this overall concept, but also uh, problem solving that situation. I would also avoid lots of questions about how are you today? Um, I think in the in the uh, context of any kind of chronic issue, whether that's chronic medical issues in a family or chronic issues with feeling dysregulated, a lot of times people are always trying to check in. How are things? What's, what's the atmosphere like? What do I need to do? Um, because that can intensify. How are you? That can uh, cause more drain to the person on the spectrum. Now I have to talk about how I am. So one of the things that um, you might want to try instead that works well a lot of times is to use some type of number or coded system. And the example that we've used at home with some success is that um, using refrigerator magnets to put uh, for each person in the household a number from 1 to 10 about their stress level at that time. And so 10 is the most stress, 1 is not stressed at all. And um, then we don't have to have this personal discussion with all of this emphasis on how everybody's doing, but we can have a glance at um, kind of a number coded system. And the things that this helps with is an awareness that people vary over time in how they're doing. And we want the person on the spectrum and others in the family to know that actually the internal state of other people changes. That's kind of a basic thing that they might need to increase awareness about. And then thinking about, you know, what caused that change? So there was something that triggered that and what was that and becoming more aware of it. And understanding that the internal state of others might be different than your internal state. So that theory of mind ability to say, oh, I'm a three, but dad's a 10, you know, and what happened there? So he's, he's different. And I remember one time that I got to work and um, my son texted me and said, why are you a six today? And it was good for me because I start work at six in the morning. So by that time, several hours had passed when he was up. And I actually thought, was I a six? And then I said, oh yeah, I was. And so then I was able to tell him, you know what? I had a headache last night while I was sleeping and I didn't get much sleep. And then I remembered I forgot to do something at work last night and I felt stressed. But now I'm actually a three because my headache's gone. I got that thing done and I just feel ready to go for the day. Um, I'm really not that stressed. So he was able to realize I had a certain internal state. It was probably caused by something. And he actually asked me uh, how I was doing and why. All right, next slide. This is the last slide, I think. So we'll get through this and do some questions. Um, it might also be nice to just schedule some huddle times, whether that's in a classroom or at, in a family, to check in with each other. So instead of kind of diffusely trying to figure out what's going on, if you make this routine of, hey, in the morning, we huddle about the day, you know, you've got uh, this after school and dad's going to pick you up and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then at the end of the day, you know, uh, what happened today? How are, you, how are uh, things going in your math class, et cetera? Uh, so scheduling it can work. Um, also, uh, scheduling debriefing after events uh, can be helpful. So what I mean by that is that I had a parent um, was on the spectrum and had a couple kids also on the spectrum um, and he had been um, playing Legos with his kids and things got out of hand and the kids started fighting and he lost it and he started yelling and he sent everybody to their room and he needed quiet and they were too loud um, and after you know he was able to process you know what I really overreacted because I'm noise sensitive 
um, and he was able to go back and then have a debrief and said, hey kids, let's talk about what just happened. I realized that I reacted really strongly because my ears hurt. But now I realize that, you know, you were also feeling things too. So it teaches them that even when something happens, they can come back and process and communicate about it. And it's this regular routine. This is what we do, we debrief. Also sometimes just using an externalizing image to remove any blame and shame in this interaction, like, hey, don't do that. You know, that's a very uh, punishing kind of statement. But instead, we could remove the judgment part and say, hey, you look like you're a volcano ready to explode today. Is that what you feel inside? You know, so again, you're just talking about their state rather than telling them to, um, you know, change it because it's not acceptable. Um, and you can use different images that are consistent with their um, interests as well. So, you know, somebody who likes trains could talk about how their engine's running. Somebody who likes weather could talk about, you know, if they feel like a tornado is inside them. So just different images can sometimes remove the uh, strong interpersonal kind of um, dance where somebody feels attacked. All right, I think that's the last one, Carissa, you wanna, is it? Okay, so I am ready yeah, to, yeah. for questions. Awesome, thank you so much. I really appreciate and enjoyed um, hearing all the little tidbits of knowledge you had to share with us. Um, I don't see any questions right now. Brittany, do you have any, see any questions? I don't see any at the moment, um, but we'll go ahead and give everyone a second to kind of gather their thoughts and get those fingers furiously typing. Um, just as a reminder, I did put the Autism College and Career website into the chat, as well as the Adult and Geriatric Autism website. So please feel free to click on those so you can have those as a resource. Um, and the handouts, the slides from today, are also in the handout section. So be sure to, to click all of those links and download all of those handouts so you have those wonderful resources at your fingertips. And we'll give it just a few more seconds here to see if anyone has any questions. You can use the chat box, the question box, um, depending on what device you're on, or if you're confident in your microphone, you can use the raise hands feature on the GoToWebinar toolbar, and I would be happy to unmute you and let you ask your question that way. Okay, we do have some questions coming in. Um, the first one is, what kind of adjustments do you make for five to seven-year-olds versus older teens? Um, well, I make adjustments based on, so for example, well, the words I might use, how I might explain something, and the images. So, um, you know, a younger person might use the image of Tigger as feeling really jumpy and excited, whereas an older person would pick a different image. Maybe they love physics and they're going to talk about electrons bouncing around. Um, so those kinds of images and what they relate to might vary based on their cognitive level, based on their age, and based on their special interests. Um, the sensory stuff, I don't think changes a lot based on age itself, but people will, their nervous system might change over time where they really need a lot of pressure for a while and not as much later. And what we do find too is that during hormonal changes, um, sensory uh, responses and experiences can change um, significantly sometimes. So during adolescence and puberty, you know, someone who was never sensitive to smell or not, didn't have that much problem with noise can really start to have a problem. Um, 
So in that sense, there might be different seasons based on age, but the same concepts really are helpful. So I recommend the same sensory books even to adults um, that are based for kids because those techniques still work. Um, I find a lot of them helpful for myself. Um, so I think just understanding too what the demands are. So one of the things that you'll have success with in helping them regulate and take care of themselves is understanding, gosh, what changed from third grade to sixth grade? Uh, well, the demands are a lot higher socially. They're a lot higher academically. They're a lot higher with regard to um, demands for independent work. Um, and so sometimes what you do might shift because they're having more difficulty based on the demands. So sometimes I'll look at the demands of their environment and try to make sure they're appropriate for what they can have success with. So the person, the best way to lead to dysregulation is to give them tasks they just cannot meet your expectation on. So um, I had a patient recently in school that um, began struggling more and more. And it's not just academically, um, her behavior just really escalated as well. She ended up in a um, hospital stay for behavioral issues. And really we did a comprehensive assessment and some of the demands in her environment were just too high. She can't meet those. And so then she becomes more dysregulated. Like if I keep saying to you, I need you to be 10 foot tall, because you know you'll be able to reach higher things, you'll um, really be able to be seen in a crowd, and I give you all these reasons, and telling you that you're missing the mark, you know you're gonna feel more and more despondent, you're gonna be less engaged, you're gonna be angry and feel shamed, and I'm gonna get frustrated with you. So sometimes the demands on the environment will change based on age, and I'll try to focus on what the demand is and whether they can meet that. Um, and, you know, the types of breaks might vary based on age. So I am a big fan of scheduled breaks at school instead of as needed um, because, again, it's difficult for them to know what they need at any given time. And sometimes approaching a teacher or signaling a teacher to communicate in front of the class that they need a break is also daunting. Um, and I know with my son, he had a lot of physical complaints um, going into, well, the whole first semester of middle school and would call and need to come home. And um, he would leave the class too often because he was anxious. And the way that we reduced that was we gave him a scheduled break. And then he didn't leave, you know, multiple times a day. Um, he could say, oh, I always have a break at this time, and that's only in 20 minutes, and I know where I'm going, and I know what I do. And at the end of the year, that second semester, the teachers just said, I wasn't a big fan of this sensory room that we have until I saw your son use it for 10 minutes a day, and he's a completely different kid. And he never called home again. Uh, he didn't leave the classroom outside of the break. Um, so that kind of thing too, whereas an adult may have grown into the ability to um, kind of monitor when they need to leave a little bit better, uh, but I find that many students don't. So that kind of thing I would think about. All right, thank you so much. So we have some more questions coming in. Um, this is more just a comment. Someone found this to be extremely helpful and they loved your quote, instead of being a police officer, be a detective. Yep. And then Margaret is a school social worker and often teachers want me to have counseling social work sessions with my students diagnosed with autism. It seems to be too much for them, like you said, too much talking. What could I do instead to support my students? Should I focus more on sensory and visuals? <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I would. I think it can depend on the student. 
Um, so I would definitely focus on sensory. So it may it may help them to um, come to the counselor's office and <laughs> excuse me, um, you know, sit in a beanbag chair to get some proprioceptive input or listen to a podcast about their favorite topic. Um, at some schools, they have support animals, which can be nice just to interact with the animal. Um, sometimes doing visuals can help, like they might be able to point to a picture or <clears throat> they might be able to um, describe what kind of image of a day they've had. Um, and then I would just emphasize those things about how, you know, it's really important to us that you feel okay at school. And so what could we do to help your system feel better? and try to problem solve that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't, because anything that's gonna be draining is gonna drain the student more. You want to be filling. So I do think there's a risk that talking is something that's draining. Um, I would also, um, oh, I had another brilliant thought. Uh, Oh, I do also think that things like um, social stories can help. And so even with older kids, sometimes they can make um, stories that are just more complex, but are still, they're almost like um, kind of a meditation imagery. And sometimes you can use even free apps like Adobe Spark, I think is the app that lets you make your own little montage with a a theme song and pictures of yourself and your own voiceover um, that can help you maybe talk through the day. Um, so I would be strategy focused. I think a visual schedule can help even if they're really good readers because it's just a glance at a day. It has so much meaning um, in the pictures where you can glance at the day. Um, and then I also might point, I might try to focus on helping them know how they're wired. Uh, so you might say to them, gosh, I'm wondering if you feel really overwhelmed today. Is that, do you think that's what you're feeling? Uh, and then you could say, some people feel overwhelmed when they have a substitute teacher. Um, I see that you have a substitute teacher in science class. Uh, you know, that could be a, a hypothesis. Let's say it's a middle school student. You know, I wonder if we could test this out, that that's kind of um, stressful. And what can you do when you feel that kind of stress? Uh, so I would focus on those things. Great. Okay, we have a couple of more questions. What are your thoughts on motivating high school students with ASD who have no interest in making friends, being social, respecting others, et cetera? Um, I think it depends on the intellectual level. Uh, so there are some people who don't respect others because the pattern of their ASD features leads them to this rigid thinking about what's right and wrong and who's right and wrong. And you can get this kind of narcissistic feel where they correct other people who are breaking the rules or who got a fact wrong or they correct teachers. Um, you know, that's one scenario. Another scenario could be um, a lower functioning student who just doesn't have the social intelligence to respect other people, but it's not driven by wanting to make everything correct. So I think figuring out what drives the disrespect can help. Um, specifically with regard to the disrespect, I think helping people who are on the receiving end maybe understand, particularly in the second scenario, that it's not intentional. Um, I think that does help. In the scenario of correcting other people and that kind of narcissistic, almost aggressive kind of student, 
Um, one thing I talked to them about is that, you know, you're really um, an influencer. You want to influence other people. And the facts are very important to you. And there's a lot of good things about that. A lot of people influence other people based on the facts. Um, one, one thing to think about is that you're going to be a lot more successful influencing people if you can understand their point of view and show them respect. And that's when you're really gonna be an influencer. So challenging that part I have found can help the person who has that narcissistic corrective kind of um, interaction style. Um, another thing that I do is talk to them about how there's really two pillars to communication. And one is the facts, which your brain loves, and one is the person. And until you do both together, you know, you don't really have that successful communication where the person is like, oh, I hear you and I get what you're saying and I can relate to that and you've influenced me. So attending to the person would mean, does this person need something explained differently? What kind of feelings do they have about what I just said? Do they need space to think about it? Do they wanna switch topics? Um, so the person on the spectrum often is very drawn to the facts and they, they very often will say, I've never even thought about the person. Like I've never considered that I was supposed to do that. Uh, so some people can self-correct once you talk to them about that. Other people are less likely to self-correct because they don't care about that. But if they do want to be an influencer and be right, um, you can try to talk to them about how they'll have the most success if they attend to both. And sometimes that helps them shift. Uh, for the person who has no interest in friends, um, I don't think that's necessarily a problem um, unless it is a problem. So by that, I just mean that there will be people on the spectrum who really function best when they have a lot of alone time. They don't have the desire to be connected. It doesn't help them feel better. And that ends up being okay. Um, the, the points at which it wouldn't be okay would be, you know, particularly in adulthood, if this is someone who's not leaving their home, not engaged with the medical system, not working, that they get lost and unsupported and it becomes unhealthy. Um, but a lack of desire for connection in itself, I might not try to correct. Um, for the person who wants that connection, but doesn't know how to do it, you know, you could work on those social skills and things. The thing to watch out for is that I would say about half of the people that I work with that have that pattern, once they actually move toward friendship, they don't really like it. They like it in theory. I want to have this person that gets me and I get them and um, we talk and we do things together. But in reality, relationships are messy and they're up and down and the person doesn't always jive with what you're thinking and feeling. And so sometimes the reality of it is not pleasant for them. And sometimes that's the therapeutic intervention where we say, you know, you really long for this connection. And yet when, when you get it in real life, it kind of feels messy and it doesn't really fill that part of you that you wish it did. And so that they have a little bit better understanding of the day-to-day -day reality of what a relationship actually looks like. Um, so those are my thoughts about that topic. Great, thank you. Um, and then sure. one last question. Could you talk a bit more about the vestibular system? Okay. So, um, you know, good resources too would be books like The Out of Sync Child or The, the Sensational Child. 
or I think it's raising a sensational child. Anyway, they can kind of go into it more, but when our bodies move through space, the fluid in our ears move and the fluid um, moves the little hairs in that inside uh, part of the ear and that movement of the hairs gives input to the brain. And there are three kinds of vestibular, uh, ways that we get vestibular input. One is linear. So if you're moving forward and back, like on a swing, if you're moving up and down, like on a jumping uh, trampoline, you're getting linear input. There's rotary input. So that's when people are spinning. So I once uh, went to my son's preschool um, for some reason, and I could see the kids walking down the hall in a single line. And one of the kids was spinning while he was walking down the line. So that's rotary vestibular input. Um, a lot of times that's actually overwhelming to people, but you will see particularly littler kids who seek that. Um, my son did a lot. Um, and then the third kind uh, way that we get vestibular input is by an inversion where your head is lower than your heart. So if you're hanging upside down from a couch or the swing set, or if you're doing a down dog in yoga or just a forward bend, you're getting vestibular input um, with, within the brain. And so I do find that not everyone, um, you know, benefits from vestibular input or feels comfortable with it. And so sometimes getting the input of an occupational therapist who specializes in sensory processing can help you figure out if that's going to be grounding and centering for that individual. I have a lot of movement sensitivity, so I do not like um, a lot of vestibular input. It makes me feel uh, dizzy and upset. And other people, you know, my husband will ride his bike like 20 miles a day and then he feels very energetic and he gets a lot of stuff done. You'd think he'd be exhausted, but he doesn't like that stationary bike. He likes that linear, fast, rhythmic, predictable movement. And so you can look at what people are doing already. So one parent that um, brought their teen in for assessment recently said that, you know, as a littler kid, he would flip that, I don't know if it was forward or backwards, but do repeated flips on the couch as a youngster. And she said, no amount of discipline would change that. And I thought, yeah, discipline won't change that he's seeking this vestibular input to feel better in his own skin. Um, so that's a clue. You kind of look at what people are already doing and saying, oh, this person previously really liked vestibular input and proprioceptive input and how do they feel about it now and how much are they getting now? So the person that used to use vestibular input to feel alert and awake and on point with their attention, you know, as they age might have um, physical problems where they can't do those things anymore. And then they might start to complain of fatigue during the day and I feel sluggish. And some of it can be, um, of course, other physical issues, but some of it can be unfortunately, that they were benefiting from the vestibular input to feel more alert and awake and on point and not being able to do that anymore more kind of leaves them in that sluggish um, regulation state. Um, but it is a little, little trickier to figure out the right amount of vestibular input and the type for each individual. So sometimes getting an OT um, assessment and input. Again, an OT within the schools really wouldn't specialize in that typically, but an outside OT may, you'd have to ask if they specifically do sensory processing work. Um, so I find that to be a little more individual specific. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm not seeing any more questions coming in. Um, so, Carissa, do you have any closing comments? I don't. I just want to thank Teresa and everybody that was on the call. Um, it 
sounds like there was some really good feedback that people learned a lot. I know I learned a lot. So thank you so much for <laughs> speaking today, Teresa, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks for having me. Thanks, everybody. Yep.